What's up, everybody? Hope everyone is having a great, safe, and blessed day. I am here today with a very special guest, John Michaels. If you're from the Atlanta area, you're very familiar with him. John, please introduce yourself to all the viewers watching. What's going on? Appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, far from famous and far from illustrious, but John Michaels, again, if you're in Atlanta, you've probably listened to me on 92.9 The Game, or you've heard me on 790 The Zone before that went out of business back in 2004. So uh, John Michaels, follow me on Twitter at John Michaels U. You can read me at State of the U. I actually have got a 10-part series that started today, kind of breaking down the University of Miami roster. You can hear me on SB Nation Radio as well on the weekends, 9 to 1 a.m. Download the app, the shameless plug. That's all you need. But I'm a cane. Uh, I mean, if, if you know me and you follow me and you've heard me on Hawkman and Crowder, you know I bleed orange and green, and I will punch somebody in the face messing with our canes. Absolutely. You got to love that passion about our Miami Hurricane fans. No matter where we are, we all bleed orange and green. Hey, John, let's start from the beginning of the Manny Diaz era. Mark Richt randomly retires out of nowhere. What did you think about the Manny Diaz hire at first? Did you like it? Were you not really sure about it. Would love to hear your thoughts. So I, I have to tell a story when I get into this because many people up here, and, and I, I used to get into it with a lot of Miami fans about Mark Rick. I told everybody, I said, look, this is who you hired. You hired a guy that's going to be a nine or a 10 win coach. You're going to feel yeah. really good and you're never going to win a national championship. And when we started 10 and 0, you know, there were a lot of Miami fans said, look, we're right. We're right. Look, he's 10 and 0. Just wait. And I didn't want the other shoe to drop in 2017. I mean, that hurt. We were 10 and 0, and it felt great. And then the bottom fell out. So 2018, when we go five and one, and then all of a sudden you start to see the wheels coming off the train. I said, Man, I have seen this at the University of Georgia for years. Like I have seen a whole bunch of this going on. And here's where we are again. And I actually had some some guys that are a lot more connected to the program than I were that told me Rick's gonna leave. They've basically given him the ultimatum to either get rid of your son and all the offensive coaches, or you're going to have to go. And Mark Rick, you know, being the, the good guy that he is, and he's a tremendous individual, and I've had a chance to talk to Mark many times. You look at Mark, and Mark realized, I'm not going to get rid of my guys and, you know, kind of go that route where I'm firing my friends and my kids and all of that. So Falcons were playing Tampa Bay that day, and I know this very well, sideline reporter for the Falcons for 10 years. So I'm doing our pregame show, and I had some intel from some folks that told me Mark Rick's going to resign today. So Wes Durham's our play-by-play -play guy, and you probably know him from the ACC Network, one of the most talented broadcasters in the world. So Wes and I were talking, Dave Archer, who does our color com commentary, and you hear him on Sirius XM, and I said, look, Mark Rick's going to resign. And they were like, stop. And I said, look, I got some sources. I, I don't know him that well, but my sources are telling me, and they're kind of laughing. And I leave from the broadcast position up in the booth because I did pregame coverage till about 1230. And then I'd work, work my way down to the field. From the time, it's almost like, you know, intervention for this to happen. From the time I left the booth till I got down to the field, which takes five minutes maybe right. in Tampa, all of a sudden I walk down and I've got probably 150 messages on my phone and my Twitter just won't stop. It's just blinging. I'm going, what the hell happened? And I open it up and Mark Ricks resigned. And I can hear Wes going, is John on? Is John on yet? And I go, what's up, Wes? He goes, Rick resigned. I said, I tried to tell you my source was there. Literally on the field, I had to turn my phone off because it just wouldn't stop vibrating. And I'm trying to do a broadcast. I hated to see Mark resign for one part because I like Mark, Mark Rick as a human. As a head coach, yeah. I knew what we were going to be in. It was never going to be back in the national title contention. I thought the Manny hire, quite frankly, was lazy. Um, but I also think it was premeditated. I think they knew that Mark was resigning and their only chance to keep Manny Diaz was to do it right then. Like literally we can't wait any longer and Manny Diaz has to be the coach. I have no problem with them hiring Manny, but here's the problem I had with that. If you're going to hire Manny Diaz, at least do the cursory search. Go interview three or four guys right. and let me know that Mario Cristobal's told you no, that Tom Herman's told you no. I don't care. Whatever guy you think, let one of them turn you down and then tell Manny Diaz that he's the head coach. And I heard people that said, well, if Manny didn't take the job that day, he was going to go to Temple. And I call absolute BS on that because if Manny Diaz, Manny Diaz could have waited until September 1st or 
let's see, we played Florida on like August 24th. You could have called Manny Diaz on August 22nd and said, you're the new head coach of the University of Miami. And Manny Diaz was coming. So I thought it was a little bit lazy with the hire, but I understand why they did it. What I liked about Manny is everything that you're seeing now. He is Miami. Right. And I don't think that could be understated when it comes to Kane's football. I want a guy that understands the University of Miami and understands where we were. And Manny's also a guy that had to work his ass off to get back to where he was. Got all the way to Texas, D.C., and then BYU and Taysom Hill ran him out of town, basically. He had to go back to Louisiana Tech, to Mississippi State, to work his way back to Miami. So he had earned everything that had happened there. So, you know, in a roundabout way, I liked what Manny did. I loved last year's offseason. Not going to lie to you. I bought into everything. Hook, line, <laughs> sinker. I was 1,000% in. When we were flying to Orlando from here, me and my best friend, on the plane, turnover chains on, I was telling everybody, Miami's going to go 11-1. and one, And they should have gone 11-1. and one. The talent yeah. on that team to the crap that they lost to last year didn't equate. So where I'm at with Manny right now, to be honest with you, it's win now or we right. need to find a new coach. He's doing all the right things from January to August. September is when you got to stop, uh, start producing. Yeah. And I like that you mentioned that John, you know, about Manny Diaz. I mean, he saw the cream of the crop at the university of Texas to be the defensive coordinator there. He was at NC state before he worked his way up. And then Mac Brown gets rid of a defensive coordinator in one year, like we did with Dan Enos. Then he falls all the way down to what is it? Middle Tennessee state. Yeah, I think he went to La Tech first. Maybe. I, I don't remember which one he went to. Yeah. But. I mean, yeah, I mean, from you're at the top, the blue blood of college football, all the way down to literally one of the worst programs. I'm not trying to put them down, but, you know, in college football. And then you got to slowly work your way back. He gets a great gig at Mississippi State, and mm -hmm. he's back in his hometown at Miami. I mean, you got to love a fighter. That's someone you got to respect. I felt like when he took the job, the Miami job, and it was his first job, he was very arrogant at first, which, you know, made us buy into the program, you know, made the off season changes. And like you said, perfectly, we were, we could have won 11 games. We lost a lot of games by a touchdown or less, except for Virginia tech. So we were in all our games. We shot ourselves in the foot tons of times against Florida, UNC, even Virginia tech, Georgia tech, basically every game. So we're there. Are you buying into this? years off season changes or are, are 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 you on a wait and see approach because we just got a Broyles award finalist OC we got a dark horse for the Heisman in Derek King Quincy Roche is coming back AAC defensive player of the year just want to hear your thoughts on that so you know I'm always going to take a cautious approach because you go six and seven and lose to Georgia Tech Duke FIU and then Louisiana Tech say what you want fluky or not there was some kind of disconnect between Manny and what you had as a product on the field. But what I like that Manny did, that Randy Shannon was not given the financial capability to do. And remember, they didn't give Man Randy any money. So I, I see that. The second part, Al Golden was too chicken crap to do with his little buddies from Penn State. He wouldn't fire anybody. And Mark Rick wouldn't True. do because of his family. Manny Diaz looked and go, Danny no sucks. He's an arrogant son of a gun whose offense is in the 1980s and doesn't work and didn't connect with the kids and he was arrogant and all this. I got to let him go. Our offensive line coach was a terrible hire to begin with, the guy from uh, Tampa Bay. I don't even remember his name. Todd, what the hell was his name? Butch Berry? Yeah, Butch Berry. Terrible fit. You're starting freshman. Obviously couldn't recruit. Get him the hell out of there. He went through and fixed a lot of the problems that were the root cause of it. Jaron Williams, you don't want to be here? See ya. And Jaron lives 10 minutes, not even 10. Jaron might live five minutes from me here in Atlanta. I'm on the oh, okay. road. His high school's four or five minutes from me. Jaron's a good kid, but there's too much of this not showing up to practice. There's, there's too much of this, you know, uh, entitlement that we saw right. with a lot of these kids. And it looks like he's trying to alleviate that. Now, I'm super happy that we finally, after 10 years, realized that, okay, we don't have the offensive line to run a pro-style offense anymore. We right. don't. You need horses. You need four and five star guys, period, to come out there and run and play the way that you want to do with a pro style offense. Golden tried pro style. Mark Richt, sort of pro style, although he went a little bit more spread. He just didn't run a lot of plays out of it. And Dan Enos was trying to run square peg round hole. 
you finally get a guy now in Rhett Lashley that's an innovative offensive mind. Go look at what he did at SMU last year. Go look at what he's done at Auburn in the SEC going up against Alabama and LSU and Florida and all those teams every single year. His offense has always put up numbers. Now, people will point to the job at Connecticut and go, oh, he was like 60th. Yeah, but the offense the year before was like 128th, and then you elevated him to 60th. And I'll be yeah. honest, Paul, you and I could probably go play for Connecticut right now. They have <laughs> zero talent, and they honestly have no business right now at the Division One level. Right. So you go get a Rhett Lashley. Garen Justice is already paying dividends on the recruiting trail, bringing in the guys that he's bringing in. Now, can that equate on game day? I think when you mesh all of that together, De'Eric King is a Heisman Trophy contender. May not be a finalist, but he's a contender. And I actually wrote about him. The article went up today at State of the U, uh, basically examining the quarterback room and can we be a championship contender team? And that's kind of what I'm going to do over the next uh, about two or three weeks is, is dissect the roster. King gives Miami something they haven't had since Ken Dorsey. Yeah. Dorsey was the last QB we had that when Portis wasn't running well or the O-line was struggling, Dorsey could put the team on his back and start throwing the football and win games. King's a guy that's pinpoint accurate and can run. So you put that together. You add Rhett Lashley. Like literally, if you go from 70th or where were we, 90th last year in offense, and you go to 40th, we're going to win 10 games. The defense was 13th which seemed like a bad year last year, but that's 13th with new corners, new defensive tackles. You know, your linebackers didn't really seem to get any better. Now, all of a sudden, you've got our, arguably the best defensive ends in all of college football. You've got defensive tackles who have played, corners and safeties who have played, and Blake Baker, who now knows what it's like to coach at a little bit higher level. So right. roundabout way, I am happy with what we've done. I'm still going to be cautious, but trust me, when I make my prediction – for what the season's going to be, the expectations are one thing. They need to be in Charlotte, North Carolina in early December playing the Clemson Tigers for a chance to go to a really, really good bowl. Yeah, no, I I truly think with this schedule, the opponents we play, even nine games for me is a little bit disappointing because I don't, I don't see three losses talent-wise. I think we're the better team talent-wise against every opponent. Even UNC, I think talent-wise – we are the stronger opponent and we play them home regardless if there's modified fans or no fans. It's still, I think we have a good shot in that game. Sam Howell's a good quarterback. But, yeah, but I, think, I think about last year's game against UNC, they get a couple of early touchdowns where they hit eat balls over the top and it's 17, three or 17, seven. I'm trying to remember where it was, but you all of a sudden come all the way back and you take the lead and what happens? Bubba Bax is missing kicks. Yes. Yeah. Stop a two point convert. You like have all these stupid things happen. And even at that, you've got them at fourth and 17. And I don't know what the hell they were doing on, on defense uh, at fourth and 17. I know in the NFL, when they're fourth and 17, they'll set up the picket fence. It'll be five guys at about 15 yard mark. There'll be two deep safeties and you make them catch the ball in front of you. Miami, I don't know what the hell they were doing. Guys were wide open. North Carolina goes down and wins. And then again, you still were back at the end of the game with a chance to tie it, and Bubba Bax's starry ass couldn't hit a kick. So with all that being said, I'm not afraid of North Carolina. People have asked about Michigan State. If we don't go up there and mud stomp Michigan State, Miami's got problems. Right. No, I agree. And remember, Mel Tucker's taking over. First-year head coach doesn't yep. even have a spring practice. So it's really, it's really going to affect first-year head coaches with Mike Norville and Mel Tucker specifically. But, John – one thing that scares me the most is offensive line. Mm -hmm. We're very young. Depth concerns me. I know we, we got a lot of experience last season. Wasn't the best stats. What position group are you most worried about? And then we'll go over the one uh, which we're excited about. You know, O-line is the easy one because uh, Zion Nelson couldn't block me. John Campbell looked like he couldn't play in the ACC. You know, you, you, Navon Donaldson's got an injury. You don't know how healthy he's going to be, how in shape he's going to be. So we look like, you know, O-line could be a trouble. For me, it's linebacker. Oh, yeah, and, that's a good point. And, and I like the fact that Zach McLeod's coming back. And I think Zach, when he played that fourth game last year when Pinckney was hurt and played really well, I think Zach will make that move to middle linebacker and have a really good season. But everything else is unknown. Sam Brooks in the bowl game looked like he can play. 
You got a couple of guys that are coming back from injury. You're bringing in some freshmen who were really productive, but you don't replace Shaq Quarterman and Michael Pinckney and just think there's not going to be some kind of drop-off. Now, I'll say this. I thought Shaq and Pink played their best football as sophomores. Juniors and seniors, I didn't think they were quite as good as they were in 2017. I think part of that had to do, you know, simply in front of them, you didn't have R.J. McIntosh, you didn't have Kendrick Norton, you didn't have Chad Thomas. You know, those guys were eating up blocks and doing a lot of different stuff, um, obviously in front of Shaq and Pink. But that's a lot of experience that they're going to miss. And I think what you need now is you're going to need the secondary, Bubba Bolden, Gervin Hall, you know, uh, Amari, who's Amari, why do I say Amari Daniels is the recruit? Amari Cooper. These guys are all going to have to be able to come in and play and make up for a little bit early on with those guys. The best thing, though, the schedule's so soft that first yeah. three. Yeah, Temple's going to be decent, but you should beat Temple just walking on the field. Then you have two weeks to really warm up for Michigan State. That should give those guys some chance. I think LB scares me maybe even more than offensive line, and I'll explain the O-line part here in just a second. Here's what I get with the O-line. Yeah. Fish is going to be able to mask stuff that Dan Enos did not mask. Okay. I watched last time, and, and I know Roman does a great job on State of the U breaking down film, and it's Amari Carter. I don't know why I said Amari Cooper. That's a wide receiver from the Dallas Cowboys. You'll watch some of the stuff that Dan Enos asked these guys to do last year, and you would have guards trying to block backside defense events, pulling to go get a DN who's getting a free rush. Our guards, unfortunately, aren't athletic enough to do that. Our guards, unfortunately, couldn't do that. Scheme-wise, how many times do we see that stupid play action with a seven-step drop, and Jaron or Kosey, by the time they get to the seventh step, you got three guys hitting you. Right. What I see right now with Lashley, you're going to go spread. You're going to have a QB that can run and make plays and you're going to get the ball out quick. And I think that's going to help the offensive line, and that's where this year, while they may not have the talent that we're always necessarily looking for, I think what they're going to have is the ability to get the ball out fast and mask a lot of the deficiencies that they had a year ago. Gotcha. Yeah, and I mean, the whole goal of this offense is to get the ball out quick. You know, you want it, obviously in the NFL, the average time you're going to get sacked is 2.8 seconds, I believe. Right. So you, you want to get it, before three seconds in college football and you know with our wide receiver group you know just get the ball out quick worst case scenario here's the thing if the pocket breaks down last season jared williams was very timid to take off and run he mm -hmm. was just in the pocket and he did not want to run for whatever reason he wasn't a natural runner De'Ara king first thing he's thinking about is taking off and running so if the pocket breaks down De'Ara king that is like your second running back on the field i mean he might go for a thousand yards that is possible with his legs he's that talented john what do you think about cornerback play this position group i'm not gonna lie scares me mm -hmm. i want to hear your perspective on it it's very thin in my opinion not a lot of experience um i don't know it does worry me it does i like the top two guys we have i know dj ivy had a really tough i don't know first five weeks of the season you know, it really exacerbated with what he did against Georgia Tech, giving up the long punt, uh, punt fake where he just stood there. You know, he gave up another big completion late in the game for them to take the lead. I think Al Blades Jr. is a dog. Like, that dude goes out and plays Miami football the way it's right. supposed to be played. He's got all conference at minimum this year, maybe borderline All-American type skills. But there is a lack of depth. Trajan Bandy leaving early kills you. You could have had all three of your corners right. coming back plus having some of the young kids that are playing up behind them. You know, now, now all of a sudden some of these youngsters, to Corey Couch or somebody like that, is going to have to step in and flat out play. I like the front too, but you know in college football now, you really need like four corners yeah. to come up and play. And this is where we're going to need our strikers. And I, I know striker kind of falls into linebacker as well. But Gilbert Frierson, Keontre Smith, uh, Keontre Smith, those guys are going to have to go out and be able to take up the slack Romeo Finley was really, really good. And I disagree with Timothy, and I see him chiming in here. Ivy's not terrible. Ivy had some bad moments for about five or six weeks. Go back and watch a little bit further on in the season. Ivy had some moments where he made a whole lot of plays. Was it against Pitt? He maybe had two interceptions yep. in that game. Had, Florida had a good game. game. Yeah, had a good game against Florida State. Uh, but I do agree with some of the other people that are chiming in. The defense – when you're going three and out on offense over and over yeah, and over, and, over and over again, and you're on the field 35 minutes a game, eventually these guys are going to let down. 
Another thing too, I mean, DJ Ivy, this was kind of his first season of getting a lot of snaps. The game slows down, you mm -hmm. know, when you go further deeper into the season. So let's give these guys another season, you know, see what they can do, see how they develop. I know I've spoken to Jose Duasso, seven on seven coach in South Florida, Brian the Beast London as well. They both say the staff is very confident in Christian Williams and to Corey Couch. We are going to need those two guys to step up. Like they, oh. no doubt about it. Yeah, you you got to think about it. not only there they're going to have to play a lot of special teams, and I know some of them did a year ago, mm -hmm. but these guys are are absolutely going to have to come in there right now and make plays. You you think about it in the NFL, nickel is played about sixty percent of the time, where you only have where you have three corners on the field and you only have two linebackers. Dime is played a little bit more, so your base four three is rarely played, and in today's day and age, again with all the specialization type of offenses you're going to play, all the offenses that are running three and four wide receivers, you're going to have to have guys, you're going to have to have probably four corners play in some type of rotation. That means Williams, that means Couch. Obviously, Blades and Ivy have to go out and play. Hell, you may have to slide Frierson over there from time to time. Even though he's a striker, he's going to have to cover wide receivers. That's what you have to do. I know guys are asking about Al Blades Jr. Blades is a star. You know, I, I love to break down, and I've had arguments with a lot of different, oh, Blades is no good because he missed the tackle against Florida right. in the first quarter. I hate to tell you, everybody misses tackles in college football. It's a lost start. They're not allowed to tackle They're, uh, during practice and all this other stuff, but I really think Blades can play. But you're right. You're going to need four corners, and it's probably you're probably talking nickel 65 to 70% of the time in college football is what you're going to play. Hey, John, I have to ask this question because it's been a hot topic, and you know, I've spoken to people and they really do like coach Mike Rump. Do you, what are your thoughts on coach Mike Rump as a position coach, as a recruiter? Cause I mean, everyone just, just talks about him constantly. It seems like he's the head coach at times, the amount of times he's mentioned. I think part of it is overhyped. Um, I know he's, he's the villain of the day because he hasn't pulled as many South Florida recruits. Right. As he had. And, and you call it like you see it. When Tyson Campbell was your uh, former player and he decides to go to Georgia, I mean, maybe there was a little bit of this involved, but that's, <laughs> that's a whole different story. When, you know, different guys, Pat Sertan Jr., and again, there may have been a bit, little bit of this involved, decides to go to Alabama, these things happen. So could Mike Rump be a better uh, recruiter? Absolutely. I don't knock that, but I will say this. This is a different day and age of recruiting. It's not easy to walk in now and just go, we're the you. Come to our school. It doesn't work that way. The SEC 30 years ago didn't infiltrate South Florida the way that they do now. Clemson wasn't a national power 10 years ago the way that they are now. So yeah. Trump is doing the best that he can. But what I do like, and I, I've talked with other people about this, I love the fact that Mike Rump develops players. Michael Jackson was a three-star nobody coming out of Alabama yeah. and turned into an all-conference player who ends up getting drafted in the NFL, you know, Trajan Bandy's a guy that's five foot seven and I get it. He was a dog down in South Florida and could flat out play, but Mike Rump helped elevate Trajan Bandy into a guy who at least got a free agent contract in the NFL. You watched him with, what was it? Adrian Colbert. I think Colbert might've been before yeah. coach Rump's time, but Rump has been able to develop different guys. I would rather have a guy that's kind of a mix, good recruiter, great on field guy because i've seen too many times in the past guys like tracy howard tracy howard wrong scheme was never yeah. developed from being the babe the boy coming out of high school to kind of making it in the nfl and that's it i'd rather have a guy that develops the guys when they get there than just gives me the flashy toys i will say this though coach rump's gonna have to pull a couple of more just give me like two corners or maybe three per recruiting cycle let's get the numbers back up no, I completely agree, John. And once again, I think Manny Diaz is aware of the situation going on with Mike Rumpf. We've seen it in the past, been brought up. Once again, let's evaluate this season. And if Manny Diaz, if he needs to make changes, it seems like he will make those changes. Sure. You know, he's shown that. So, hey, I'm all fine. Let's see what Rumpf can do this upcoming season. And then we'll evaluate the staff. A lot of people say our defensive ends are going to get to the quarterback. And um, that's going to help with our pass defense. Do you agree with that, John? 
Absolutely. Pass rush, uh, and, and trust me, again, working for the Falcons for 10 years, I've seen lack of pass rush. I've okay. seen them go out and drive. I mean, the Falcons were one of the worst teams getting to the quarterback a year ago. Even the year they got to the Super Bowl, they were near the bottom of sacking the quarterback, although Vic Beasley had a great year that year. You get pressure on a quarterback, you absolutely will have corners that don't have to cover as long. You mentioned three seconds earlier on. Imagine if at two and a half seconds, all of a sudden you have a guy that's getting there and the quarterback, even if he doesn't get sacked, has to get rid of the ball earlier. How many times have we seen in the past, especially when Al Golden's candy ass was the head coach, quarterback would sit back there, make a sandwich, and eventually guys are going to get open. These are D1 receivers as yeah. well. They're going to get open. So you all of a sudden have Quincy Roche. You have Greg Russo. Don't forget Jalen Phillips, who looks like a completely different person in a year than when he arrived on campus. You've got those guys. I think Nesta Silvera is set up to have a monster year inside, finally as a junior coming around. Right. Start getting pressure on the quarterback. Suddenly Blades and Ivy and Williams and these guys, they only have to cover the receiver two and a half, maybe three seconds. You do that. You come up with more turnovers. We get more chains. And then all of a sudden, quarterbacks get skittish, and they start getting rid of the ball. I, all you have to do is look at the Florida State game from a year ago. Alex Hornibrook was scared crapless. James Blackman did not want to take snaps, and that's because Miami lived in the backfield. Do that against Virginia Tech. See how Hendon Hooker feels. Do that against Sam Howell. He's suddenly not going to sit back there and pick you apart for 300 yards. Yeah, and that, I think defensive tackles, they had their best game against Florida State because mm -hmm. we got to the quarterback. So they were yeah. able to wrap up. So One of the big things, and I love to use the analogy for the NFL because I, I was there and got yeah. to see it a lot. The only way you beat Drew Brees is get interior pressure. Drew Brees, we used to love to call him a short setter. He's a guy that would take that three to five step drop and rhythm throw. Well, short set doesn't allow DNs to come rare, roaring off the edge. Think about that for a second. If all of a sudden Silvera's getting pressure inside and you've got Russo and you've got Roche and you've got Phillips, and I love this. The guy said the NASCAR package. Those are my favorites. You rock Russo down inside, put him next to Nesta. You've got Phillips. You've got Roche and say, go get the quarterback. You know what the quarterback's doing? <laughs> right in his pants. <laughs> hey, John, what? give me a position group that we should be excited about as fans going into this season. I mean, it's easy to say defensive end for everything we just right. talked about. For me, it's running back. Um, I thought Cameron Harris was way underrated and maybe yeah. undervalued. And I love DJ Dallas. He's a kid that's from uh, Brunswick, Georgia here. You know, got a chance to see him play in high school and he played everywhere. I love DJ. We're going to miss DJ's leadership, his toughness, all of this different stuff. But I thought Cam Harris can play. But then when you bring in two electric recruits, like you got the two yes. best running backs out of South Florida. Sony Michelle's not leaving to go to Georgia. Dalvin Cook's not leaving to go to Florida State. You kept these kids home. You have home run hitters that, I'll be honest, we haven't had in a while. Like, think about it. Mark Walton was a really good back, but Mark Walton was more shifty. Travis Homer had home run capabilities, but I thought he was more an in-between the tackles. He's going to run your ass over. DJ Dallas, multifaceted, but I don't think DJ Dallas was a guy that was going to outrun a ton of people, you know, just in a 4-4 sprint. Right. Now that you go get these kids that are high schoolers and, and Rooster can flat out run. I mean, you've got monsters. And you're in an offense that's going to spread everybody out. Now, all of a sudden, you can't load seven or eight in the box. You can't do that daring, you know, no no disrespect to Malik Rozier, because I love the fact that Rozier went out and beat Florida State, beat Notre yeah. Dame, and I'll always respect him for that. But you know good and well, Malik Rozier wasn't going to beat you with his arm. All of a sudden, King can beat you with his arm, so you have to respect the pass. Brevin Jordan's arguably the best, not even arguably, he is the best tight end in college football. Screw Kyle Pitts and Pat Fryermuth and all these. They can't hold Brevin Jordan's jock. You've got that. Now, all of a sudden, you've got these backs that one cut and they're out of there. I cannot wait to watch the running backs. Cheney, Knighton. I mean, you've got monsters. They will contribute as freshmen, too. Yeah, no, I'm really, really excited about Jalen Knighton. I remember the moment he flipped from Florida State to Miami, I it just something hit me. I was like, hey, Manny might be onto something. That was a rare flip. And that's the recruiting battles you need to win to build a successful program. You know, Dalvin Cook, imagine if he flips to Miami. I know he was committed to Florida State for a while. 
that Dalvin Cook effect at Florida effect at Florida State that won them so many football games, and that, it was really just one guy. He beat us at least twice by himself. I think we lost up there 29 24 in 2014 or 13. And then the next year, we played the game where Kaya had us in the lead. And then all of a sudden, Dalvin Cook takes over. If Dalvin Cook is in Miami, and, and I like Joe Yearby, had we got both of them, Al Golden might still be the coach, as much as that pains me to say. But that's the difference between winning 10 or 11 games and winning seven games is yeah. having that elite guy and getting Knighton and Cheney. We finally got that elite guy. Now, we need that guy at receiver. I'm not going to lie to you. We can't keep allowing, and, and I know we got a good recruit, uh, Jacoby George, the other day. We yeah. got to get more of them to stay yeah. home, those elite guys. Can't have Calvin yeah. Ridley and Jerry Judy going to Alabama. Those guys need to stay home, and Miami will get back to being Miami. 100% agree, John. You know, speaking of position groups that do excite me, our safety group, I don't remember the last time we've been this deep at safety. I mean, Bubba Bolden, mm -hmm. Amari Carter, Gervin Hall, and then you got you bring in the number one safety in the nation, Avante Williams. And those are just four guys off the top of my head, not including other freshmen. How excited are you about you know these safeties coming in? Because Bubba Bolden, he graded out extremely well in the limited time he played at Miami last season. There's a reason Bud, Bubba Bolden was so highly recruited uh, and so yeah. highly thought after coming out of high school. You saw it a year ago, and unfortunately, you know, the, the stupid injury that he has against Florida State cost him the back half of the season. Um, it really, really hurt, but I love Gervin Hall, Palm Beach Lakes. That's where I went to high school. Uh, my, my teammate all through growing up actually is a Miami alum, Al Shipman. He's the head coach at Palm Beach Lakes now, so shout out to Ship. Uh, but Gervin Hall is a monster. He's another one that the game needed to slow down. Like that's what he had to have yeah. happen. And finally, when he got the game to slow down, you saw Gervin Hall becoming the player that he was. You put him, Bolden, and Carter's a guy. Honestly, I'd like to see Carter try striker a little bit because he can cover and he's going to come up and thump you in the run game. Then all of a sudden you get Avante Williams. And I love the fact that he flipped on signing day and had all the Gators crying, putting their little jean shorts on because they were so confident that he was coming yeah. there. And then all of a sudden he put on the orange and green. But I do like the safety position. And think about it. You know, this is a group that Miami's always had players. You can go all the way back to Benny Blades in the mid-80s. Miami's always had elite safeties when they've been good. Benny Blades, Daryl Williams. Obviously, we know Sean Taylor and Ed Reed, Brandon Merriweather, all of C.J. Richardson. You can go back. Like, all of these different guys were those type of players at safety. And it looks like now we may have to. I mean, think about it. Jaquan Johnson three years ago was an elite safety. He's part of the reason they started 10-0. and 0. You need one of those guys to step up this year, become that leader. But I do think we have the pieces in place. Yeah, no, no doubt. I'm, I'm getting excited. John, are, are we winning the national title this year? I, I, <laughs> I wish. That's Miami, every year. I'm going to tell you, Miami wins the national title. I'll get my entire back tattooed. Um, oh. <laughs> and I've got Miami tattoos everywhere. You can't see them right now. I'm actually going to get another one uh, uh, Saturday. Okay. There's a, there's a T-shirt they have, I believe, at All Canes where it's Sebastian holding up the five rings and he's wearing the U turnover chain. I'm getting that tattooed on Saturday. Yeah, so. no, I, I think I would, um, you know, some people go to the Vatican City to pay their respects if you're Catholic. I'd go to SMU just to pay my respects to them, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> yeah. And again, you're talking to a guy whose firstborn son is named Kane. Like that's his <laughs> name. -A -N -E. So that, that'll let you know where my level of craziness about Miami is. So, um, but no, I don't think we're national title ready. I, I, yeah. We're a year or two away. Unfortunately, we only have King for one year. We're going to need Van Dyke or, or, or maybe Garcia to flip and end up coming there. Oh, yeah. Get them to turn into being the type of players we want. But when you look at blue chip ratio, and I know a lot of people love to do that, Miami's above the 50% blue chip yeah. ratio. And when you're above that, that means you have enough talent. The problem is teams like Georgia, although Georgia and I live 60 miles from Athens, they'll always choke their ass out of a championship somehow. They've got like 90% blue chip ratio. Yeah. They've got, you know, we've got to find a way. And this is something I've talked about on State of the U and with Hockman and Crowder and everybody else. Something mentally is not right at Miami, and it hasn't been for a long time. Coaches have changed. Players have changed. The mentality hasn't changed. It's too many times that Miami right now has fallen into the trap of we're Miami and we should win. 
There's too many times Miami will win two or three games like they did a year ago. You won three in a row. Okay, awesome. And then you come out and you lay an egg against FIU. That mentality has to go away. Losing has to kill these players the way that it did Michael Irvin and Brian Blades and Warren Sapp. Those guys would cut off a leg. Go ask Melvin Bratton how he was in the 1987 National Championship game. I had uh, Kelvin Harris, who was a center on a couple of the championship teams in the 80s. Dude, those guys tell you they would have given their arm, leg, or firstborn to win games. We need our kids to do that now. And you know what's interesting, John? I want to pick your brain because this is my little theory I kind of built up. Um, you know, we've had, you know, Lawrence Cager, he did an interview with Footballville Nation, and he's basically said, hey, like, I was going to go to Alabama. I was committed to Alabama. And, like, they pulled out at the end due to an event that occurred. Mm -hmm. um, and by default, like, I had to pick Miami. Jaron Williams committed to Miami because he was committed to Kentucky. He didn't really want to go to Kentucky. He was just in the SEC, but Miami beat Notre Dame on his visit. And Jeff Thomas as well. He was committed to Illinois, I, I believe, where they were in the hunt, in the mix. And then Miami kind of came in late for, for him. So I feel like we're, we're bringing in players by default. Do you, do you see that in the past, just late grabs? Well, I think part of it, you've had too many times where we would swing for the big fish and then didn't have a fallback plan. And this is where Manny, I give him credit. They've offered like 17 to 20 quarterbacks. Okay, you've missed on a bunch of them, but at least you're still swinging in the ballpark. You're not looking and going, hey, number one, this is the guy that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going after him and that's it. Like you weren't going after Justin Fields and missed Justin Fields and then said, eh, that's it. I'm not going to, you know, I don't have a fallback plan. And that's how you end up with Evan Shurifs. You know, nothing against having sure. He had no business playing quarterback at the University of Miami, period. Yeah. He should have never been on the field. Malik Cade Weldon. Weldon. Yeah, Cade Weldon never should have got a scholarship. Gray Crow. You know, we can go back down to Preston Dewey, I think, was another Cannon one. Cannon Smith. Cannon Smith. Well, they did that because his dad had money at FedEx. I think that's oh. the only reason. Yeah, his dad was like the founder or president of FedEx. Oh, I think wow. that's part of why they ended up with Cannon Smith. But the point being, you've had all these different guys that weren't Miami quarterback worthy. Now at least you're swinging and you're trying to be in the ballpark. I look again at wide receiver. You finally get one to commit, but again, it's only June. You've got plenty of time to get some, some guys in here before December, but at least it seems like there's a plan now. They're right. attacking, I call it carpet bombing, and I use this theory when I was at the club all the time. When I was a single man, if you went out and talked to one girl, that girl may not like you, and then you're going you're going home with nothing. Right. If I go out and talk to 20 girls, there's a good chance I'm getting four or five phone numbers before the night's over, and then I can work from there. Right. It's the same thing with recruiting. You can't say, okay, I've been recruiting a year ago after losing to FIU, Georgia Tech, Duke, and, and Louisiana Tech. Kids still see Miami, A, destination. It's an unbelievable city. It's a great school. But they still remember. They look and go, man, they've got five national championships. And they're putting a Hall of Famer in seemingly every single year. I could go back there and make that school what it once was. Hey, John, people are asking, um, can you just re uh, reiterate the your podcast, SB Nation, and any other platform that, platform that you're a part of? Again, sorry. Twitter's the easiest way to follow me, at John Michaels U. Just like I said, John Michaels U. I'm on SB Nation Radio uh, Saturday and Sunday nights right now, 9 a.m., or 9 p.m. to 1 a.m., and then I write for State of the U. So you'll see my articles up there, State of the U. There was one posted today around noon. So that's the easiest place to find me. I do have a podcast. I'll be honest right now. Podcast is Falcons-related. I don't do anything Miami-related. That's something that's in the works. I may end up doing YouTube or something else. I just don't want to steal your guys' shine. And then you can hear me on Hawkman and Crowder. Usually during football season, it's every Monday I'm on with them. Non-football season, it's probably once a month or so I go on with my two favorite guys down there. Definitely. And John, you know, we were talking about um, you know, recruiting. I want to pick your brain on the quarterback position. Do you like the transfer portal? I kind of like it because it gives you kind of the best available prospect. It is a free agency kind of ring, but I also believe in developing a quarterback mm -hmm. from high school. I, what are your thoughts on that? Should we utilize it more or? I, I like the way Manny's done it. You got to remember Miami was struggling depth or lack of quality depth. So he's done a really good job of bringing yeah. in quality players. I mean, think about it. Roche, King, Bolden, Phillips. Those might be our most talented, like 
maybe not best players, but most gifted players on the field. I like for college football because, uh, and if you've ever listened to me on the radio, I have very strong takes about college football. These kids should get paid. Point blank, period. They should be getting money for what they're doing. They're not normal students. Don't give me the crap about their scholarships and everything else. But the second thing, you got to remember, think back to when you were 17 years old, the decisions you made. So you can commit to, Lord knows, I made some of the dumbest things in my life where it's 17 to 20 years old. You could commit to a school today. And I, and I use Isaiah Walker. Isaiah Walker probably wanted to go to Florida. And he got up there and he realized, oh, crap. This isn't all candies and unicorns like I thought it was going to be because when they take you on a recruiting visit, they're just going to show you the good. Right. Absolutely. The hottest club. They're going to take you to the best restaurant. They're going to bring the hottest girls around you. The players are going to have you doing everything that you want to do and you're going to fall in love because that's why when these kids go on a visit and they love the school and then maybe a week later they go on another visit and they love the school. But the portal gives kids an opportunity to make that one mistake. And I think, especially, and you got to remember, and I use Nick Saban for an example, you start getting guys that come in and are promised something. You know what they're promised? You're going to come in and play as a freshman. You're going to come in and and compete as a freshman. And then they get there and they realize, crap, I'm seventh on the depth chart. Nick Saban (laughs) lied to me. I'm not as good as the six guys in front of me. I can go somewhere else and play. So I like the portal. What I do like uh, is the fact that I do like what you're talking about with developing quarterbacks. I think to be a great program again, A, you have to take a a quarterback every year. And this is to use Omar Kelly uh, from the Sun Sentinel. He always has said draft a QB every year. I think you recruit a QB every year. You never know. Kid could be five-star and get on campus and stink. We've seen that. If you go back, and it's funny to go back and look over the five-star quarterbacks over the last 15 years, I believe half of them were unequivocal busts. Like they were just terrible. Yeah. Guy, Gunner Keel transferred like three different times as like the number one or two quarterback in the country. Yeah. Now you have Trevor Lawrence and J- Justin Fields on the other side, but you've seen Kyle Wright. He was a Gatorade player of the year, came to Miami and was pretty average at best. So I do think to be a great program, you have to get to the point where A, your quarterback doesn't have to start till he's probably a sophomore or junior. And B, you get to these guys where they develop. Problem for Miami, haven't got that quarterback to develop. You've had guys like Kaya leave a year early where it creates a vacuum, and and all of a sudden, instead of Perry being able to redshirt and learn under Brad Kaya, you suddenly had to thrust Malik Rozier in there. Now you have depth. King is your starter. Think about it. Perry has won games against ACC teams. Going to win a national title with Nikosi Perry? No. But I think in this offense, Perry is perfect as a backup. Tate Martell, I don't know what the hell he is. But now all of a sudden you have a freshman in Tyler Van Dyke that will sit, that will not play, that will redshirt, and then all of a sudden next year he gets to compete for a job. That's how you build a program. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've missed on a lot of quarterbacks um, for whatever reason, you know. I mean, hey, we're, it seems like we're fixing that problem now. Hopefully, you want me to give you the worst stat you'll ever hear about Miami quarterbacks? The last Miami quarterback to take a snap in the National Football League during the regular season is Brock Berlin. Brock Berlin graduated in 2004. Stephen Morris has taken snaps in preseason. There has not been a regular season snap taken since Brock Berlin. You You can't can't win. You can't win. You can't even win the ACC with that. Yeah, you can't. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it shows, I think it's lack of your, it's, it shows value in your coaching staff. Mm-hmm. You know, your backbone of ed, of every program is your assistant coaches. You know, there's the head coach and then your assistant coaches, you know, are truly the backbone. I think that's what's been missing at Miami. And I really do like this offensive staff. John, offensively, do you think Rhett Lashley can get the ball rolling year one or is it true what they say Rome wasn't built overnight? You know, the Joe Brady effect at LSU, that is, you know, one, that's an anomaly. It doesn't happen a lot. So what do you think about Rhett Lashley? He needs to average 35 points a game or le- or, or at least. Um, the talent is there to do it. It's not like he's walking into in Indiana and trying to create something. Miami has talent. It's just been misused. We've tried to run the I formation that was great in 2000. 
you know, again, you had Bryant McKinney and Shirko Haji Rizuli and Joaquin Gonzalez and all these, yeah. Brett Romberg, and you had McGahee and Port. You don't have those guys right now. Yeah. So all of a sudden now you're going to run something that at minimum takes advantage of the pieces you have. So if you go from 90th and I'll use 40th, if they go to 40th right now offensively, you're going to be around 35 points a game. You're going to be up close to 450, 500 yards a game, and you're going to take a ton of pressure off your defense. I absolutely think with De'Eric King, you're going to be really good offensively in your yeah. number one. I think lastly, and you, you think about it again, he's been at Auburn, so he learned a lot under uh, Gus Malzahn. He gets to SMU and he learns a lot from Sonny Dykes. Those are two completely different spread concepts. Malzahn runs a power run spread. He wants to speed you up and run you around and do all of this different stuff. But all he's doing is basically running inside zone and outside zone just from 9,000 formations at a speeded up pace. Sonny Dykes comes from Spike Dykes, which is his father, which is one of the all-time run-and-shoot, up-tempo passing offenses. Leach was out of that tree and everything else. So now you get the best of both of those. With a quarterback who's run a similar system under Tom Herman, who's run a similar system under Dana Holgerson, and you've got athletes everywhere. These kids got to love the fact that you look around and go, James Prochet caught 90-some-odd balls a year ago from SMU. James Prochet. He wasn't recruited to come to Miami. Right. Watch guys like Mike Harley and, and, and Wiggins and all these other guys go out and put up monster numbers this year because they're going to get opportunities. So, yes, I do think Rhett, Rhett Lashley will have this thing turned around pretty quickly. It, it sounds like too good to be true. You know, imagine Mike Harley getting 96 receptions. I can't remember the last time a Miami receiver had that many receptions. I can't even remember the last time Miami's offense put up 35 points or more. Or we even had – an. You know the last time Miami was good offensively? It was 2002. 2002. I went back and looked at the stats. Miami hasn't been above 20 scoring-wise since 2002. How are you at Miami 60th, 65th, 80th, 91st, 103rd offensive? Jed Fish had some offenses in the 30s that were pretty good, you know, as far as national rankings. Yeah, yeah. We haven't had an elite offense since 2002. And plus, you know, Miami, like traditionally as an identity, we really relied on our defense to make plays, kind of create turnovers and then special teams like, you know, returning punts. That was a, that kind of changed, you know, the game for us a lot. I felt like with special teams, great defense and then offense, you know, just did its job. Um, John, you know, I truly think as a team, you know, starting lineup, we look good. You know, I don't I think we're a solid team. How is our depth? Are there any positions where, hey, if this guy goes down, another player goes down, it's it's going to be scary? Corner is the number one, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have a lot of bodies there. I don't think we have full quality depth, at least upperclassmen-wise in the offensive line. Gotcha. And I'll go back to what I was just saying about quarterback. Offensive line, unless you have Vernon Carey, unless you have, you know, I'm trying to think Alex Leatherwood or some of these guys that have started year one at Alabama, you should not have freshman offensive linemen starting at tackle. Offensive line is one where you need a year in the weight room. You probably need a year of technique. And then maybe as a redshirt sophomore, you're a starting offensive lineman and you feel good because you've got college strength. Miami loses any start. Like right now, I have no earthly idea who's starting on the offensive line. No clue. <laughs> you know, I, if you told me line up one through five, I could take some guesses. I don't know who's going to start one through five. Is Jalen Rivers going to start as a true freshman? Is Isaiah Walker going to walk in as a true freshman? Are, they're more highly recruited than Zion Nelson was a year ago. We had a two-star kid that we were fighting Appalachian State for as our starting left tackle. Not so good. that's the one spot where I need to find out, can we get eight? Can we get eight solid contributors? You're going to have your starting five. I need one backup tackle that can play left or right. I need two interior linemen that can play, and one of them's got to be able to snap the ball. So I think, you know, once we figure that out, but that's where my depth scares me. Anywhere else, receiver to me is a little thin with guys that have actually done it at the college level. I know you just brought in a bunch of freshmen. You know, I know Harley's been there for a while. Wiggins had some moments a year ago. Peyton's a guy that, you know, has it's, it's got all the tools it looks like, but he hadn't produced on the field. Can you find that guy? You know, receiver scares me, but not as much as offensive line. Okay. John, 
is Manny Diaz on the hot seat going into year two? Damn right he is. <laughs> I, I said this on Hawkman and Crowder. I don't hide from my opinions. I would have fired his ass as soon as he lost to Georgia Tech. Um, I would have fired him again when he lost to Florida International, and I damn sure would have fired him when he lost to Duke and Louisiana Tech. Yeah. He is on the hot seat. This isn't Mississippi State. This isn't Georgia Tech. You know, Coach Collins here, if they make a bowl game, they will flat out go crazy here on the flats if Georgia Tech's in a bowl. It's the University of Miami. The standards, I know we've been pretty mediocre for about 15 years. But the standard is not, hey, we're going to make the Coastal. Or, hey, we're going to be in the Blue Bonnet Bowl. Screw that. The, the standard at Miami is at minimum to be in an ACC championship game. And if Manny can't get it done this year, you know, if he goes nine and three, is he going to get fired? No, of course not. He'll be in a bowl game and they're going to say, look, the trajectory is going up. He goes six and six again. He's got to go. Yeah. And, and there, you know, and that means clear everybody out. And, and I'll tell you the name and people have laughed at me when I said this, if Manny Diaz doesn't cut it this year, Miami needs to pull out a blank checkbook call Urban Meyer and say, what's it going to take to get us back to where we need to be? Period. Yes. I love it. No, no. I, 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 as much as people give Urban Meyer, you know, crap, you know, everywhere he goes, Utah, Florida, Ohio state, they win. Bowling the green. He was undefeated at Bowling green, Bowling green in Ohio, mm -hmm. everywhere he goes and the recruits there. He didn't, did he recruit or coach Alex Smith, Tim Tebow, Cam Newton? I mean, Corey, Quarterback wise, he's a guru. We just got the worst one in Tate Martell. I don't know from all the recruits, it's it's our luck with these guys. But but here's the thing. You know, I, I think, that's what I'll say about Tate. I don't know what Tate is. I know he didn't work in Dan Enos' system. Yeah. Period. But I watch high school tape of that kid. The kid can play. I know. Flat out, the kid can play. He, I he think he's gonna work in Ohio State system because you're running that read option. And he looked good in their spring game as well with the mm -hmm. highlights we saw. Hey, John, um, what do you think about Joe Brady? Oh, I love Joe Brady. <laughs> right. And he's from Everglades High School in Broward County. I mean, he's mm -hmm. a South Florida guy. Um, that that was one name. I know you mentioned Urban Meyer, but I just I got a good feeling about Joe Brady, man. I, I really do like him. I know he's with uh what's that guy's name? Matt Rule. Yeah, down he's at, uh, and he's in Carolina. I you know, he's always been an NFL guy. He had the one year at LSU and it worked perfectly. I mean, that's all that it is. Um would he come back and be a head coach in college? Who knows? What I'm hoping for is we don't have to have that conversation. Right. I, I, sorry for interrupting you. I kind of see Manny as like the Jimbo Fisher effect. You know, he comes in, he was a DC. Uh, Jimbo Fisher was an OC, I believe, at Florida State. Um, mm -hmm. You know, has that effect. It doesn't click maybe at first, even though Jimbo went nine and three. Uh, wins a bowl game, but you know, Manny, I like the adjustments he's making. He's not a stubborn coach. He is learning and he wants to win. So I do appreciate that. And look at the recruiting class. He reeled in six and seven, right. That's a pretty solid recruiting class 13th in the nation. And what he's building right now, I think there's a lot of promise in Manny Diaz. I was very critical on, on him year one, but he was arrogant. He was cocky. He's learned. He was humbled. He lost to his first year head coach in Mac Brown. And then he lost to a Dan Mullen, two head coaches he worked with. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, but the big thing is he has at least taken the, the different approach that we talked about earlier. He's not stubborn. He went out and got new guys. It looks like he's cleared out some of the cancer that was in the locker room. And right. I'll call it like it is. There were too many players that were disconnected. There was too much fake bravado with Miami. Um, I love the chains. I'm not going to lie. I've got each one of them sitting upstairs, and I'll wear them. Whenever I feel like it, I think the rings are stupid. You know, you didn't score enough touchdowns last year to be running on the sideline. And this will tell you where I think the team was mentally. You were down 28 to nothing to Virginia Tech, 28 to nothing. And you throw a Hail Mary at the end of the half that you end up catching. And you have Nikosi Perry and who caught it? I, I'm trying to remember who caught the uh, Mark Pope caught it. Mark Pope. And you come sprinting. It's 28 7. You're getting your ass kicked on national TV. And you sprint to the sideline and you're putting on touchdown rings. That's where the mentality is wrong. And this is the one thing that I really got on Manny Diaz about outside of the coaching acumen during the year. You had these kids getting plaques, player of the game plaques, whether you won the game or lost the game. And I, I never forget Jaron Williams posted, oh, I got the player of the game against North Carolina. Screw that. You just lost to North freaking Carolina, who you should never 
lose to in football. Yeah. You lost to them on national TV to go to 0-2, and, and you've got kids running to social media, putting plaques on. And this goes back to my thought of this has to change. The mindset of these kids doesn't need to be, ooh, I got a ring or ooh, I got a chain or ooh, I got some plaque or look at my stats for social media clout. If I'm Manny Diaz, I'm taking Dabo Sweeney's approach. Season starts, your social media is closed. You're not allowed on social media until the season's over with. Kids don't like it, get the hell off my campus, period. I'll find kids in here they are going to do it. I'm going to rule my football team as a dictatorship until we start winning football games. Herman Boone on Remember the Titans said you're going to do it his way, period. Herman Boone always used to say football's not fun. Football is fun when you're winning. When you're losing, you look like a clown. When you're running to the sideline, losing to Louisiana Tech on the stupid-ass bowl game in the middle of December, and you're running to the sideline to put on a chain, you look idiotic. And that's something that Manny needs to clean immediately. Whether And I want to keep the t- turnover chain. Let me make that perfectly clear. <laughs> the wings have to go, the plaques have to go, and social media has to go. Win some games and you can earn that crap back. 100% agree, John. What is your... I- are you doing an article on your season prediction? I don't want to ruin it for you. So okay. I'll still put the season prediction out, but I'm, I'm more than willing to tell you. Yeah. yeah. What, what is your season prediction um, for the 2020 season? Miami should lose no less or no more than two games. No more. Okay. And I look at that schedule and I'll be honest, I don't know where you lose two games. So the ones that I look at that scare me, you're at Virginia Tech. We've historically never really played yeah. well there. Although they're a program that's dealing with their own problems. You know, uh, Fuentes run off a bunch of kids. He rallied them a year ago. So you get them on the road. You're on the road at Virginia, although they lose their quarterback, who we beat the crap out of last year anyway. But they're very well coached under Bronco Mendenhall. Florida State, say what you want. It's usually a toss-up game, no matter how good or how bad they are. I'm not buying, period. I'm not buying North Carolina. Those are the three games I look at that you might have a chance to lose. You have to find a way now to not lose ones that matter when it comes for a chance to get to the ACC Coastal. Um, So you probably have to split the Virginia schools, and you're going to have to beat Florida State, which you were going to do anyway. It'll be four in a row over those little trolls from up north. Yeah, I can I can definitely see those games you mentioned. I think I don't know why that Georgia Tech game kind of worries me. I know you're in Atlanta, so you have a, probably a better perspective on that football program, but a lot of people are high on Jeff Collins. Jeff Collins, tremendous guy. One of my favorite people to talk to. In two years, you better watch out. Georgia Tech's going to be a true contender. Okay. They just don't have talent this year. And I'll be honest, that loss to me might have been the worst of all the losses we had a uh, year. It was horrendous. It's terrible. Gave up. You gave up a, a, a fump, you, you got a sack. They gave him the ball like first and goal at the one. You gave up a fake punt for a touchdown. And what they got something else that they did on us. Uh, whatever it was, you gave up a late late score somehow. But there was complete fluke. That team is dreadful. They have no bit. They should win that game by four touchdowns up here. Think about it. That's a team that lost to the Citadel last year. And we lost to them. Yeah. No, it was um, – that was – yeah, no, I mean, Perry, that kind of wrote, wrote Perry off for me that game because I felt like leader of the team and switching quarterbacks, switching kickers, it it was dead. You know, the team was dead at that point. And that's when you knew Manny lost the locker room in that they always say, When you have two quarterbacks, you have none. When you have three kickers, you have none. You cannot play quarterback roulette. And we've now done it two seasons in a row. We played kicker roulette all last year. I mean, you, you look at this right now, it, it's a struggle. And this is where you need Borgalis, you need King. Yeah. You guys got to be your all day, every day. They got to be your main girl that you're going to ride with from now until whenever. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, John, let's do a little bit of a rapid fire real quick. So if you guys have any questions, um, please ask John. We got five minutes left. Um, put it in the comment section. John, thank you very much for joining the show, man. Greatly appreciate it. I got a question for you. It has nothing to do with Miami Hurricanes football at all. Why did the Atlanta Braves leave Turner Field? Terrible location. Terrible uh, location. I liked Turner Field. I liked it a lot. That was cool. That was location, very nice. Yeah, I liked where it was. The problem is when they built it, they never built rapid transit to get there. 
trying to get to that stadium right south of the downtown connector at 7.30 or 7.05 was impossible. You're talking about the busiest part of the city. Now, granted, they're up in Cobb County. It works better. Plus, they got the mixed-use facility around there, uh, the battery now that's got all the restaurants, this, that, and the other. So right. that's why they moved, and it, it came down to, again, Cobb County ponied up a whole lot of money, which the city of Atlanta didn't want to. Gotcha. Hey, John, what uh, I want to pick your brain. How did we get this low as a program? 20 different reasons. 20. Number one is cheap. They were cheap as hell. You had I, I Larry Coker was a good coach. He got lethargic. When you let him go, you got lazy and cheap. And it's nothing against Randy Shannon. Shannon deserved a head coaching job, but you hamstrung him by not spending money on assistance. So that's number one. Number two, 25 to 100 misses at quarterback. Lazy-ass recruiting. Lazy player development. Horrible hires with Al Golden after Randy Shannon. So, And, and then Donna Shalala, I'll never leave her off the hook. She didn't want the program to be successful football-wise. John, do we have any shot at beating Alabama next year, possibly with Nikosi Perry or without Nikosi Perry? What do you think? Yes, we have a shot, but uh, I, let's get through this year first. That's a game I can't wait for. Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta. I will represent as much as anybody possibly uh, being down there watching the Canes play. We have a shot, but it's a different animal. LSU showed us a year ago we weren't ready. Um, but Alabama's a different animal all entirely. And you better imagine Nick Saban's going to be ready to win. Randy Noel, he he doesn't like Romello Brinson. He thinks he should go to Texas A&M. Do you, are you familiar with Romello Brinson? And who is your favorite recruit that Miami is in the mix for? Oh, man. Talk about who we're in the mix for. Uh, is it Leonard Taylor, the big defensive tackle out of uh, South Florida? He's yep. a must get. Again, we talk about keeping the elite of the elite home. He's a kid that I think if we go 10 and two or 11 and one, you can go get him. I, I think that's all of a sudden you're going to have players deciding, hey, I don't want to go to the swamp in Gainesville, which why would anybody want to go to college up there? I want to stay home in beautiful South Florida. You got to win games. He's the guy I'm most excited about. And I'll never turn down local kids. Brinson's a local kid. Isn't he a Northwestern kid? Yes. You cannot turn down Miami Northwestern kids, even if they're fringe. We've taken too many candy ass guys from out of, out of state to let somebody like Brinson go away. Do you think if Miami gets 10 wins, wins the New Year's six bowl game, you know, how, how big of an impact is that moving forward? You know, I, we kind of saw impact with Mark Rick going eight and four, winning the Russell athletic bowl game. And then we had that big season go to the orange bowl. Do you see a similar impact or is there a rebuilding year? No, it's huge. I mean, you can, College is different than the NFL. You can actually carry over, um, you can carry over momentum from one year to the next. You can't even remember these are eighteen to twenty-two year old kids. They start reading their press clippings. They start beating their chest. They start feeling good. Let them start off six or seven and zero, oh, and watch the confidence of Miami. Yeah, if they go eleven and two, or you know, make it to the ACC title game and lose by like ten to Clemson, but then win a New Year's Six Bowl, probably the or uh, you know the Orange Bowl, cool. All of a sudden, next year, you're going to feel a hell of a lot better about yourself. John, the Gators, um, at the moment, I would say they have a better football program because they have Dan Mullen. They just came off an Orange Bowl win. You know, they do have a sold-out stadium every week. Do you think Miami is still a good football program to sell to recruits or the time or the, the past? It's running out and um, kind of, what's the word for it? Just the mystique about Miami, it, it's died out. What, what are your thoughts on that? The mystique has died, of course. Most of the kids now have never seen Miami be great. They saw them a few years ago. Here's what I'll do when, when you start thinking about when people go, oh, they have more fans. Eh, that sounds great. How many times has a guy in Section 308 won you a football game? Never. <laughs> Florida had sold out fans three years ago when they went four and eight or five years ago when they went four and eight. They had a sold out stadium when they lost to Georgia Southern, who didn't complete a pass that day. Right. Florida's a better program today. They beat us by four with bad coaches, a redshirt freshman uh, quarterback, and an offensive line that gave up 10 sacks. They ain't that much better. And I'm here to tell you, Dan Mullen, point blank, is Mark Richt. He's yeah, no. They're going to be, oh, Dan Mullen. I saw them asking, are they going to go undefeated? They've never gone undefeated. They're not going undefeated with Dan Mullen and Kyle Trask. The hell with that. Florida's a program that is a deck of cards right now that will fall within the next three or four years. Mark my words. No, I completely agree. And, and, How oh, many kids, oh, and I want to ask this real quick with the yeah. uh, fan thing. 
for true Miami fans, go back and look at our fan base in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. I know everybody likes to think that Miami was sold out every week. No, we were on TV because back then you only played the biggest games on TV. When that happened, you saw us sold out. When yeah. they would play TCU or they'd play Wisconsin, who stunk back then, I went to a lot of those games. Those were the games we could afford to go to. You know what? There were 35,000 fans there. The same amount of fans go now. The difference is Miami just isn't very good, so our big games are fewer and further between. Right, and John, plus the Orange Bowl, I mean, 35,000 looked like a really good crowd. I went to the Miami-Tennessee game, the Soldier game, and it wasn't even sold out at all. I mean, right. it was half empty, and that was a top-10 matchup. You know, so I think – you know, kind of the layout of Hard Rock Stadium and Dolphin Stadium previously it really made it look a lot less people than it was. Well, and now the way they've reconfigured Hard Rock Stadium is fantastic. It's right. loud. Uh, Notre Dame obviously knew what that was about. Florida State a couple of years ago knew what that was about. We can get people in there, but the problem you got to win football games. It's still Miami, and there's a lot of things to do instead of watching a six and six football team. John, are you familiar with the Miami Palmetto Five? Um, sure. How many do we get from there? Uh, if, I mean, if I had to guess two, I don't know. I'll, I'll just throw a number out to, I don't yeah, know who yeah. we're going to get. If we get two, that would be great. Cause they've got what two or three, five stars and then two, four stars. You know, I I'll be honest. I don't follow recruiting hardcore, hardcore until we get closer to signing day. I hate to watch kids today sign. And then they, they retract and not sign. They commit, then they retract, commit, right. retract. That to me, I, I think when a kid commits, if he retracts, bye-bye. Kick him to the curb. Do you think Miami's defense is going to be the key to putting up 10 or more wins, or will it be the offense? It, it's the offense. You were 13th I'm in the sure. country a year ago defensively. Two years ago, I think you were 6th or 5th defensively, and you won 7 and 6 games respectively those two years. The offense has to catch up. I mentioned this earlier. You haven't had a top 30 offense or top 20 offense since 2002. You get to 40 or 30 this year, Miami's a 10-win team. I would literally bet this finger on it. John, last question. Is De'Ara King a legitimate Heisman contender or he's not? Yes, contender. Will he win it? Probably not. He'd have to go 55, 60 touchdowns, and Miami's going to have to go 11-1 and or 12-0 and for him to win it. The problem is you have two guys right now in Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields. And Justin Fields went 40 touchdowns and one interception a year ago. Those two guys are going to get every benefit of the doubt. It would take King having like a Burrow-type explosion. I think he's a guy that'll be in the mix. I think he'll put up some monster numbers against a lot of teams. You got to remember, our our schedule's so candy-ass. He should be able to put up a bunch of numbers. He won't. If I'm going to pick right now, Justin Fields is going to win the Heisman Trophy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think Ohio State in general is the favorite to win the national title, unfortunately. And little known fact, Jason Day was on Al Golden's staff. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Miami got the worst of the litter. But hey, John, (laughs) it was a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day. And John, uh, send off everyone, um, kind of whatever you want to say. Hey, again, check me out on Twitter at John Michaels U. Very easy to follow me. You'll see my ugly mug actually sitting in the same chair, I think is my avatar picture. Give me a follow. Uh, Make sure you check me out on SB Nation Radio, 9 to 1 a.m. Saturdays and Sunday. I write for State of the U. The articles are up there. And, Paul, anytime you want to do this, especially when we get closer to football season, let's get this thing rolling. Awesome, John. Hey, sounds like a plan. And everyone, hope you have – everyone has a great rest of their day and always all about the U. Always.